Hi everyone. I'm Nikita Rajay. I'm uh, one of the immunologists at Children's Mercy Kansas City, and I'll be the uh, moderator for uh, today's case. Um, I'm one of the members of the ECI uh, committee on CIS. Um, in fact, um, this is the last month of my serving on the ECI committee. Um, but I, we are here with a, an interesting case. Uh, the name of the case is a case of arthritis and infections. Uh, the presenter for today is Dr. Sonia Parashar. She's uh, a first year fe uh, allergy immunology fellow at Children's Mercy Kansas City. And um, our senior mentor for the case today is Dr. Luigi Noturangelo. Uh, Gigi does not really require a, an introduction to this audience, but as a short introduction, he's the head of immunodeficiency genetics section and chief of laboratory of clinical immunology and microbiology at uh, NIH. So with that, I'll hand over um, the uh, uh, hand over the presentation to Dr. Parashar to take it away. Thanks, Dr. Rajay. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Sonia Parashar. I'm one of the first year fellows at Children's Mercy in Kansas City. I'm presenting a case of arthritis and infections. I wanted to thank my faculty mentor, Dr. Rajay, and my senior mentor, Dr. Notarangelo, for all their guidance, encouragement, and support while making this presentation. Um, before we get started, I wanted to point out that slide two and three of my presentation um, focuses on this patient's infections throughout her life prior to diagnosis. However, during the first three years of her life, her primary issues are more rheumatologic, which then changes into more severe and frequent infections between years three through six of life. Okay, so let's get started. Um, our patient was born at 41 weeks via an emergent C-section due to concern for fetal distress. This was her mother, mother's and father's first child together and individually. She was admitted to the NICU for premature ruptures of membrane, feeding intolerance, and sepsis rollout. She remained on IV antibiotics for about two days, which were then stopped. She was initially fed by NG tube, but quickly advanced to full feeds. Of note, of of note, her birth weight was 5 pounds, 12 ounces, putting her in the less than 10th percentile for weight. At six months old, the uh, patient was admitted from her primary care office due to concern for presumed septic arthritis. History and physical at that time noted that the patient's mother had noticed that she could not fully extend her left leg since birth. Lab work obtained at that time showed an elevated white count of 31,000 with 55% neutrophils, 5% fans, and thrombocytosis. After further evaluation with MRI and aspirating of the joint, she was treated for culture-negative septic arthritis with the suspected organism being Kingella, though concern for an, an inflammatory etiology had been raised. During this admission, it was also noted that she had certain dysmorphic features on exam. A microarray was performed, and it was revealed she had a duplication of the 15Q13.3 chromosome. She was also noted to be small for age and having difficulty gaining weight, and she was diagnosed with failure to thrive. She was able to discharge home for about two months and was later seen in the rheumatology clinic at about eight and a half months years old. She was still having difficulty extending her left knee, and there was concern for continued inflammation. After an adequate treatment for her presumed septic arthritis, her CRP was still 17.9 and ESR was 13.7. Peripheral smear, smear had atypical lymphocytes and she had new onset anemia. She was readmitted for an expedited evaluation. Um, bone marrow biopsy was performed and was negative for malignancy. MRI showed serositis of both knees without evidence of osteomyelitis. Opto um, was consulted and found no uveitis. Her rheumatoid factor of note was elevated at 25. After an extensive evaluation, she was started on a steroid taper and was diagnosed with juvenile idiopathic arthritis. It was noted at follow-up about one month later in rheumatology clinic that she actually had improvement of her range of motion. She was started on methotrexate and then eventually on a TNF inhibitor um, to have complete resolution of her symptoms. Um, between ages nine and 18 months old, there were no documented admissions are, at our facility and she actually started gaining weight. Um, she then presented to rheumatology follow-up at 19 months old, and at that time, mom felt like overall her daughter was doing quite well. However, on exam, it was noted she had two enlarged 
hard and mobile cervical lymph nodes, which were palpated. White count was slightly elevated at about 17.59 with no anemia or thrombocytosis. Her absolute neutrophil count was above 10,000. Head and neck ultrasound was obtained and there was concern for lymphadenitis. One month prior, mom actually reported that she had an episode of outpatient treated pneumonia and she um, was she completed a five-day course of azithromycin at that time. Um, during this uh, follow-up, she was again readmitted to the hospital for three days of um, intravenous um, clindamycin and then was discharged at uh, like uh, at day three um, after the cervical lymph node had decreased in size. And then between 13, I'm sorry, between 19 and 34 months of age, she actually did quite well from a JIH perspective um, and developmental perspective. Again, at 34 months, she required a seven-day course of Keflex or Impetigo. And at three years old, she had her first episode of herpes stomatitis. She was admitted this time um, due to just um, terrible mouth ulcers and uh, dehydration and feeding difficulty, but it was eventually discharged about seven days. So about one month later, she returned to rheumatology clinic at three years and one month old and was noted to have a large bump on her chest. She was readmitted and eventually found to have MRSA chest wall abscess involving the musculature. This abscess required surgical incision and drainage as well as intravenous antibiotics. She had recurrence of herpes stomatitis about five months later with another episode of outpatient treated pneumonia. During this year of multiple serious infection, infections, the patient's mother started noticing that her daughter was having fevers several times per week that were not associated with infections. She reported fevers every 48 to 72 hours that would reach about 101 to 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Due to the fevers and infections, she was actually referred to immunology between year um, three and four years of age. Initially, the thought was she had um, she was too immunosuppressed on her methotrexate as well as her TNF inhibitor, but despite being off it for months, she continued to have significant infections, including candida esophagitis, um, streptococcus pneumonia, as well as streptococcus bacteremia, requiring an ICU admission. Um, she, while she did not have any evidence of hypogammaglobulin gamma globulinemia. She did have poor vaccine response and was started on subcutaneous um, immunoglobulin re replacement with really good um, clinical response. However, she was still admitted for HSV meningitis at age six of life, despite being on immunoglobulin replacement. So this is a summary slide of um, sort of the non-infectious um, issues that she had in her first six years of life. So around six months old, she was diagnosed with failure to thrive. She had the duplication of um, chromosome 15. Again, at eight months old, she was diagnosed with JIH. Year um, three to four, she started having recurrent fevers um, and was put on um, subcutaneous immunoglobulin. Um, she was noted to start having right eye twitching and was eventually found to have epilepsy. And at about six years of age, she started having um, bloody diarrhea with a raised um, calprotectin. So there started to be concern for um, inflammatory bowel disease. So regarding the patient's birth history, mom reported no prenatal complications and no exposures to any illicit um, substances. Family history was unremarkable for any history of inborn error of immunity. Through the microarray, the mother was found to be an asymptomatic carrier of 15Q13.3 chromosome. Her heritage is Irish, German, and African-American. Um, in addition to failure to thrive, she exhibited developmental speech and motor delays, and she lives at home with her mom, stepdad, and two um, step-siblings. Um, physical exam was revealed an elongated scalp, short um, philtrum, uh, significant overbite, splenomegaly, clubbing of her hands and toes, and reticular skin. All other symptoms were unremarkable. So, All right. So, Dr. Parashar, I'm going to stop you here to see if anyone ha has any questions for you. And if not, what are people thinking? So yeah, far... Put, put in Put in the chat, actually, whatever diagnosis you're thinking of. I think we have one year. Dira?
So it looks like we are leaning towards other inflammatory diseases. Uh, there's another question here. Um, did she have elevated double negative T cells? We haven't discussed yet the um, immunological findings, but no, uh, there wasn't any elevation double negative T cells. So would, would other people agree with a possible diagnosis of uh, DRA, which is L1 receptor antagonist? More questions, Sonia, for you. Did she have a rash with fevers? Was, it, was the fever associated all, always with rash? Um, no rash associated with fevers. Any uh, history of vaccines precipitating these features? Um, none that were documented in the chart. So no. So let's go back to the point that actually Dr. Habibala uh, has raised. Um, would people agree that this is potentially another inflammatory disease? And what would not be consistent with other inflammatory disease? Dr. Abbas is also asking, is there any postulosis? None. I mean, obviously, uh, in this case, the clinical presentation does include several features that may make you think of another inflammatory disease. There are also, though, um, a number of episodes of infections, proven infections. So you have, at the same time, an immunodeficiency and, um, and some features, potentially, of inflammation. Infections were... So, Sonia, why don't you remind people, were the infections mostly bacterial or viral? What type of fungal? What type of infections again? That's a very minor. Yeah. yeah, so um, in the first six years of her life, it was primarily um, pretty significant bacterial infections. Um, so MRSA, pestle abscess, um, streptococcus pneumonia, uh, that, that one ended up with bacteremia plus in, in the ICU, but she had had two more uh, chest, uh, chest x-ray confirmed pneumonias as well that were presumed bacterial. Um, she did have two episodes of um, herpes stomatitis that were treated as an outpatient, but then she did have an episode of HSV meningitis. Um, so significant viral and um, bacterial infections. The, yeah, with a, with, a, with a predominance of bacterial infections, though. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then, uh, well, a couple of questions that are related. Um, Dr. Uh, Lesman is asking whether the patient had normal inflammatory markers in between episodes. You did mention actually markedly elevated white, white blood cell count. What yep. about CRP and did the white blood cell count normalize in between the episodes? Yeah, so the white blood cell count would normalize, but the CRP, I think the lowest I saw it in, um, in between episodes of infection were still in the um, like 17 to 18 range, would go up to 60s. Um, during the infectious rain or during the infectious episodes, so they were still okay. elevated. There's one interesting question for something we're going to discuss later. Um, how was her lymphocyte count? Uh, at least the total lymphocyte count at this point, without making any comments about substance. How, was how low was? Yes, the lymphocyte well, count was, was it normal. normal. Was it low? Yeah, how was it? It was normal. So any other thoughts on potential uh, diagnosis? All right, so uh, again, Dr. Abibala uh, is suggesting a combined immunodeficiency with immune dysregulation. People are suggesting to look at immunoglobulin and lymphocytes. Why don't we move forward, um, Sonia, with the next slide. Let's see, Ig total, total Ig, was it normal or elevated? Uh, it was total Ig was I think normal. It wasn't super elevated, but I have that in the next slide. There we go. Platelet count. Okay, and then platelet. Well, before we go there, then uh, is the patient short? You, you did mention some dysmorphies, but is it is the patient also short? She is. Yeah. Okay. All right. Why don't, why don't we go to the lab since many people were mm -hmm. okay? So another 
another potential diagnosis here. What, uh, why don't we go to the next slide uh, where you have actually some of the uh, labs that people were asking about? Sure. So um, this was some of the initial uh, laboratory values obtained. So as you can see, she had um, normocytic anemia. Um, platelets were within normal range. Um, white blood cell count was normal. So this was during a time when she was not acutely infected. Um, there was no neutropenia, neutrophilia, no lymphopenia, no monocytosis, um, no eosinophilia. Um, so the IgG was within normal range for her um, for her age. However, IgA was elevated, IgL was low, and Ig was normal. Um, her LPM was normal, as was her, her, her LPA as well. Um, these were the initial pneumococcal titers, and she actually received a booster, but did not um, was not able to mount a protective um, right. amount. So, so there are many interesting features here. So first of all, okay, so there are some data that would suggest uh, an immunodeficiency, like the inability to mount uh, uh, good antibody responses to pneumococci in spite of boosting. Um, there's also this markedly elevated IgA. So let me ask you, any evidence of liver disease or inflammatory bowel disease in this patient? So no liver disease. She did start having um, the uh, bloody diarrhea with the elevated calprotectin around six years old. Um, and eventually um, later on was put on sulfasalazine. Um, and there is some real concern that she has concomitant inflammatory bowel disease, though when they did a colonoscopy, um, they, the um, biopsies were negative for any Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Okay, and then again, Dr. Uh, Rabat is asking, uh, was the anemia sideroblastic? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Because of the short stature, um, also uh, spondyloenchondral dysplasia with immune dysregulation or Spank syndrome had been uh, suggested. Uh, just an interesting uh, hypothesis. Uh, another question here, is she frequently have throat infections? Um, throat infections, no more, um, no, she did not have any frequent throat infections. Okay, why don't we move to the next, um, oh, flares triggered by cold? Um, flares? Flares of the disease triggered by exposure to cold. No. Cold temperature. No. And it doesn't really fit with that. Why don't you move to the next uh, next slide? Okay. So this is her. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, here are the subsets that people were asking about. Yep. Yep. So um, the so you could see no T cell lymphopenia um, in her T cells. Um, there was slightly elevated um, B cells that you can see, this, the CD19 and 20. Um, her NK cells were actually slightly low. CD4 um, naive cells were slightly ele were elevated as well. Um, CD8 naive were not. Um, and then um, memory B cells were low, both the um, unswitched and switched. Um, however, her plasma cells were elevated. Yeah, and I, if I have to say, I mean, out of all of these um, subsets that you show on this slide, the ones that are really more impressive are the B cell ones, like the increase in, in, in plasma blast and the uh, very low number of memory B cells. How old was the patient when you um, tested for this? So she, um, these were obtained uh, when she was six or seven years old. So this okay. was right around diagnosis. So at this at this time, actually, you would expect to see more memory B cells than just an absolute number of two or 0.1 percent. That's really very very low uh, for a six seven year old uh, female. Okay, what did you do at this point? Okay. So, um, oh sorry. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Yeah, these are just a few more uh, labs that I wanted to include just from a rheumatological point of view and, and other um, 
uh, TSH, HIV, other infectious organisms that were um, obtained and just a review of some other genetic um, modalities that she got. All right, so what are all of these data um, show you? At least the other antibodies on the left, they're all negative basically. So someone, someone had, you know, hypothesized an immune dysregulation condition, clearly not an autoimmune condition based on this data. Right? Would you agree? Yep. Sonia? Yep, yep, sorry, yes. Yeah. And that also addresses the question of cytopenia. It wasn't autoimmune. Um, so there is no evidence whatsoever of clear autoimmunity in these patients. Uh, Dr. Royers is um, suggesting, could this be data two? So did you measure ADA2 levels? ADA2 levels? Um, truthfully, I, I don't know. Yeah, again, it, it wouldn't really fit, although, you know, data two is so heterogeneous that uh, um, anything is possible, but it doesn't really fit. Um, Dr. Kalashnikova is hypothesizing uh, uh, in immunosis dysplasias, but again, uh, um, yeah, she had so short stature, but were, were there any signs of uh, bone dysplasia? Bone dysplasia. Yeah, I, there was no mention of any um, bone dysplasia. Later in her life, she developed osteoporosis, but nothing at the beginning before her diagnosis. Telomere length. Telomere length. I don't recall that being in the chart anywhere. So she was she was short, but was investigated for telomere length. I don't and think so. And uh, then related related to the high IgA and potentially um, GI tract inflammation. Did you measure uh, fecal calprotectin? Yes. So calprotectin um, at one point was. 280 was pretty high, um, and then eventually has normalized now within the last few years after diagnosis, and that's off um, sulfasalazine. Okay, so but we, we can consider also another, you know, the GI tract involvement, uh, GI tract inflammation is another uh, component of our clinical picture. And then the diagnosis of uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, mm -hmm. was it a clinical diagnosis? Um, did you have any additional elements to validate that diagnosis? Yeah, it was mostly a clinical diagnosis. Um, and that was initially at like the seven month old uh, mark. And then as this, um, as her history presented more and more, I think that was felt like that was not um, completely accurate. Now, can I ask you, um, how was this patient growing uh, in terms of weight? And uh, did you consider also malabsorption and did you pursue colonoscopy and uh, GI tract biopsies? So she, um, she was always below the fifth percentile, though growing on her own curve, if that makes sense. Um, she did have a number of colonoscopies, um, but those were, let's, actually she had an EGD and that was found, that was when the initial diagnosis at like around four years old, that's when they found the candida esophagitis. Um, they had three more or two more EGDs done, one to confirm that the candida esophagitis had improved. The second one, or sorry, the third one was again to see if it was there. It wasn't. Two colonoscopies were done later in life and were both, per the notes, poor prep, um, but no evidence of um, any uh, malabsorption or CRIPS or... Um, or any sort of inflammatory bowel disease markers or blunted villi, that kind of thing. Okay. And I guess also to address um, other uh, questions in the chat, uh, I believe that a patient did not require oxygen su supplementation, correct? Never. Yep, correct. And yep. she didn't have hearing or vision problems, right? Correct, yep. Right. Never had those. Uh, so, well, she's a female, so FOXP3 uh, was not looked for. Um, T-Regs, I haven't seen T-Regs in, um, in the flow panel. 
um, I guess you didn't look for T reg numbers, right? Regular T cells? Yeah, did not look for that, no. Candidiasis, nail dystrophy, any evidence of um, fungal infection in our nails? Um, none that were recorded. Okay. So let's move to the right of your slide where you start having now some genetic studies. So no site, well, I mean, there is a, no cytogenic abnormality by chromosome analysis, but then a microarray did show a duplication of chromosome 15Q13.3. Uh, what did you make out of it? Yeah, so um, kind of like reading through the notes and kind of understanding more about it, uh, reportedly it's associated with um, developmental delays um, and actually has an association with um, schizophrenia as well. There's paternal history of schizophrenia, but um, there's no association of immunodeficiency recorded in the literature. Okay, and then obviously, uh, like others in the chat, you have been thinking of another inflammatory disease because you look for periodic fever gene panel, which mm -hmm. was negative. Mm -hmm. um, so did that lead you to rule out another, inflam another inflammatory disease or, or not? Um, when you received a negative periodic fever gene panel, was that enough to rule out other inflammatory diseases? I don't think so. I don't think it... I think it's a negative test, but the clinical suspicion is pretty high still. People are asking, which panel did you use? Oh, gosh. Um, it was, I, I honestly don't remember. It was, it has 15, 14 genes on it, I believe. If that makes any sense. All right. But then you did pursue uh, next generation sequencing. Of, of So was it a whole exome or all genome? I believe it was whole exome, if I'm remembering correctly. Correctly. That's correct. Exome. And, and, and quite frankly, um, you know, in this day, so what year was it when you did this? How many years ago? So this would have been, um, sorry, so she would have, she was, two, so this would have been 2016. Okay. I would say, you know, nowadays probably, um, you know, a limited gene panel with only, um, 14 genes for other for um, other inflammatory diseases is probably uh, not good enough. Yep. Um, all right. So a very interesting uh, hypothesis. Scott Canna is actually suggesting what is called CREA, which is a cleavage resistant RIPK1 induced other inflammatory syndrome. Uh, you're close, Scott. Very close. Um, we'll, we'll see what it is. But um, again, uh, just to emphasize that probably uh, when you deal with patients like this, uh, you may want to go straight uh, for a whole exome or genome uh, sequencing. Um, panels may not be good enough in these cases. Um, people are also asking whether somatic variants uh, were considered. And we now know more and more that, uh, you know, somatic Variants in genes may be associated also with features of other inflammation. There are a number of uh, such conditions, in fact. Uh, so it's a good thought, uh, Amit. Um, uh, rasopathy, um, another possibility. Let's move on and let's see what happens. Sure. So this was just my summary slide, um, but I can continue if you want me to. Yeah, keep, keep going. All right. So diagnosis is Hoyt deficiency. She's one what of two known. What, what is this? <laughs> Great question, Dr. Not Angelo. So um, Hoyt, um, Hoyt or Hoyle um, one interacting protein is the catalytic subunit of the linear ubiquination assembly chain or Lubeck complex um, necessary for NF kappa B signaling. There are three units, including, including HOIP, um, heme oxidized IRP2 ubiquitin ligase 1, and shank associated RH domain inter interactor sharpen. Um, I have a, a diagram in the next page, which will make more sense. So the Lubeck activity is regulated by um, linear ubiquitin specific ubiquitinous otolin. In patients with Lubeck, um, deficits um, tend to exhibit immunodeficiency, autoinflammation, and amylopectinosis of the cardiac and or skeletal muscle. 
So let me make a comment here. So I'll say, yeah. uh, you can say now. You can say. You can say. With a, I think it's good to show the pathway. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Just one comment about the um, combination of um, features that you alluded to in the last uh, row of your slide of your previous slide, where you listed basically immunodeficiency, autoinflammation, but also amylopectinosis. First of all, um, what is amylopectinosis? Do you want to? remind people what it is so um so the first case um it's basically like a infiltrative disease within the um, muscle that um like in the first case i know that they did a pos stain or pas stain that was positive and um the diastase was not reactive so that's as far as i know <laughs> yeah so it's so these are actually was a patient of mine and uh, okay. and then there were other patients in uh, France that had exactly the same uh, uh, the same features uh, with accumulation of uh, um, diastase resistant um, glycogen basically uh, in uh, skeletal muscles, including the heart. Uh, those were all cases of HIL one deficiency, not of Hoyt deficiency. And I have to say that in, well, you, you show this, but basically this is a very, what you're talking about here is a very rare um, genetic disorder, but none of the cases of Hoyt deficiency so far reported do include amylopectinosis. So we don't know whether uh, the amylopectinosis is specific to oil one or whether there may be some Hoyt or potentially even some Sharpin deficient patients. Uh, that may have uh, this feature. The amylopectinosis, though, in the oil one deficient patients was actually the cause of death. Um, the immunodeficiency or inflammation of my patient in particular with oil one deficiency was completely rescued by uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, but the patient died years after the transplant because of uh, uh, this infiltration of uh, uh, the, uh, the heart, basically with um, massive amounts of um, glycogen. Uh, so it's something to keep in mind if you have patients with all one deficiency. Uh, so why don't you discuss briefly um, what happens when you have mutations in any of these components? And again, both OIL1 and OIP deficiencies have been des described in humans. Sharpin has been described in mice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wanna, so- you wanna, Yeah. Yeah, so any like, so basically, the, this complex is necessary for linear ubiquination. And um, that is important for um, activity of NEMO, um, like MIDI 88. Um, and that kind of helps with keeping, pre preventing cell death and keeping the kappa B pathway going. So when you don't have that, that kind of promotes cell death in there, then you get more inflammation. This is the biggest thing that it, it also stabilizes certain um, receptors that you can see here. Exactly right. Um, and I should say that also uh, it's sensitized in particular to TNF, uh, TNF uh, induced cell death. So you did mention that your patient had received TNF inhibitors mm -hmm. and, uh, and that she, she had responded to the TNF inhibitors. Am I correct? Early in yep. life. Yep. No, that's right. Have you pursued that? Once you um, uh, knew that this was a Hoyt deficiency, have you continued to give TNF inhibitors? I don't think she's gotten any more TNF inhibitors. Okay. She was but it's definitely, it's definitely something to consider in, in, yeah. in, in these disorders. Yeah, that makes they sense. They may respond to TNF inhibitors. Yeah. Okay, so you are here, you have an interesting situation where you, on the one end, actually, you have immunodeficiency. On the other end, you have hyperinflammation. Um, well, let's see what you have in the next slides, and then we can comment on on this, you know, dichotomy. All right. Yeah. So here's the story of the TNF and the RISK-K1. So um, Scott, you wanna if you wanna put anything um, else in your that's why I I mentioned that Scott Kenner was very close. Um, you can see RISK-K1 um, and um, uh, the association basically with uh, the Lubac complex there. Um, so it's definitely a group of diseases that have many things in common. And yeah. A20, by the way, also there. Yeah. Yeah, move on. Okay. Um, yep, so this is um, Hoyt deficiency. So I kind of wanted to go over some of her um, interesting 
genetic. So she's um, a novel compound heterozygous a mutation in the RNF31 gene, which encodes, encodes HOIP. Um, she has a single nucleotide exonic substitution and a splite site variant in the R RNF31 gene. Um, her mother was actually heterozygous for the splice site variant, as you can um, see in figure C, um, while the paternal DNA sample was not available. Um, so she doesn't have um, exon 7 and 9. And when you don't have exon 7, um, Hoyle, um, HOIP cannot interact with either HOIL or SHARPEN, which destabilizes the Lubeck complex. And with exon 9, um, the interaction between HOIP and HOIL is actually unchanged, but she, um, the HOIP cannot interact with SHARPEN. So either way, you're destabilizing um, the Lubeck complex, um, in which I just wanted to show that and share that. You have additional okay. slides? I do. Um, so, you want to uh, on this? Yeah. yeah, so um, so 3A, um, the one on the left side, um, this is just showing NF kappa B activity through um, stimulating some of her monocytes with TNF. Um, so these cells displayed reduced phosphorylation and um, decreased degradation of I kappa B alpha and delayed phosphorylation of I, IKK alpha and beta, suggesting impaired. Um, activation of NF kappa B and um, the B is just, um, 3B is just showing that the monocytes actually had um, increased accumulation of intracellular TNF. Um, and then this, this also is very important for um, the CD40 and CD40L ligand interaction with B cells, which specifically the Lubeck complex can help with that, which might explain um, part of her hypogammaglobulinemia. And Absolutely. So that is an important part of the immunodeficiency. You also have, you know, impairment basically MIDA, ADA dependent pathway here. Uh, but you're absolutely right that uh, uh, you this impacts on CD40 ligand um, um, activation and um, uh, so basically T cell mediated response as well. Yeah. So my next slide is a comparison of the two known HOIP. Um, uh, deficiency cases in the world. So the, the one on the left is the first one and the one on the right is our patient. So the one patient, um, the first one that was um, published, um, that patient was actually from Kuwait. She was um, about like 17 or 19 years old when she presented. So she was literally a decade older than our patient. She also had recurrent bacterial viral infection. She had subclinical amylopectinosis that was proven on um, sternoclinical cladomyestoid um, uh, biopsy, as well as systemic lymphangioactasia, which called systemic um, edema, multi-organ inflammation. She actually had T-cell lymphopenia, as you can see here, whereas our patient didn't. There was a comment that maybe this was more due to age and demographics, um, but not really sure exactly why here. Um, you can see that both of them have reduced um, naive CD4 counts. Um, our patient had more than the first patient. Um, our patient had much more B cells um, than the other one. They both had um, decreased um, memory B cells. And then uh, the first patient actually had hypogam, both of the IgG and IgM, whereas our patient only had IgM, but neither of them really responded to polysaccharide vaccines. So if I may say, I mean, I again, I followed the first patient uh, because she was followed in Boston. Eventually, that patient, by the way, died in Kuwait uh, for unknown, uh, with unknown cause of death. Um, but the patient was hypogam because she had also um, this um, uh, lymphangiectasia, and, and and you know she tried. Um, multiple ways of treating um, her protein loss um, okay. to the lymphatics. And, and, and so that is the reason for the, for the loss of immunoglobulins. And I would, I would suggest that also the um, lymphopenia that the patient had was also uh, due, at least in part, or maybe predominantly, to the lymphangiectasia. So I would not say that whether the lymphangiectasia uh, is part of heart deficiency, I really don't know because your patient didn't have um, lymphangiectasia, nor did any of the OIL-1 deficient patients have lymphangiectasia. So it's possible that a patient from Kuwait 
um, who was the product of a consanguineous marriage, mm -hmm. may have had additional things, uh, additional genetic uh, defects um, on top of the um, OIP deficiency. But as you show on this slide, uh, the two patients do share um, actually problems with uh, production of um, antibodies to Streptococcus pneumonia. It's, it's, it's clearly defective, uh, profoundly uh, abnormal in both individuals. And both of them had a history of infections, uh, both predominantly bacterial, although uh, both patients also had viral infections, and multi-organ inflammation. That is the common feature of um, all of these de defects of the Lubach complex. So this is the thing to uh, keep in mind when you have this association of uh, autoimmune, uh, not autoimmunity, but uh, autoinflammatory conditions as well as uh, recurrent bacterial and viral infections. Let's see, Amit says, carrier state of the mother is for an X-linked carrier, but this is not an X-linked disease. Thought, uh, great case, there are overlap, uh, immunity. immunity. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there are both uh, gain and loss of function associated with risk k one defects. Um, right, and, and again, uh, uh, these, all of these defects actually are exactly, exactly as um, Scott is pointing out, uh, this overlap with uh, immune dysregulation basically. Um, so again, when you see this association of uh, infections and uh, immune dysregulation, especially in the setting of um, really inflammatory uh, conditions, not so much about immune conditions, you have to think of defects along that pathway, which actually starts with RISC-K1 and then goes all the way down uh, to uh, the Luba complex, the A20, um, ICAPA BKG, so NEMO. Um, all of these are on the same pathway. Um, Anything else, Sonia? Yeah, I had um, just a kind of an update, like since diagnosis, what's been going on with the patient. So she actually um, has been following with cardiology. So she had, uh, when she was diagnosed, she had an echo and it was noted that her left ventricle is slightly dilated. And she's been following since then and her EF actually dropped to um, 40% or less than that. And she's been on an ACE inhibitor um, it's now recovered, but she's never had like clinical signs of heart failure, but she's actually um, getting a repeat MR, cardiac MRI pretty soon um, this month. Um, they got one last year. There was no sign of any infiltration at that time. Um, then she had another repeat episode of Canada, Canada esophagitis. We talked about the inflammatory bowel disease. She actually now has psoriasis. Um, she was put on methotrexate for about a month, unfortunately didn't tolerate it, developed cellulitis, MSSA bacteremia, um, and stopped it, was now on phototherapy weekly. She falls with pulmonary too. Initially it was for a cough, but then multiple CTs have found like tree and bud opacities. She was treated with a boriconazole. She's had two or three bronchoscopies that have never truly grown anything. Um, she's never had bronchiectasis. And then she also has been followed for nodules that have decreased in size. Um, as I mentioned before, she at one point she had a DEXA scan that had osteoporosis on it, but she was treated with vitamin D and calcium, never on bisphosphonates, but thankfully have normalized. Um, she's actually homeschooled um, and can do a lot of her IADLs and ADLs, um, speak in sentences, and she's very sweet. So um, last slide is my references and just a huge thank you to Dr. Rajay and Dr. Nova Angela for getting me through this. <laughs> I mean, this, this was an amazing case. Uh, you know, let me let me say a couple more things. First of all, if you go back to slides, you did mention uh, psoriasis. So the sharping, uh, the sharping uh, deficient mice have also um, skin abnormalities, and those are typically treatable with TNF inhibitors in mice. So another reason why you know you could also consider uh, tnf inhibitors in this case and then one very important point um when uh, we studied uh, these cases of um first case of oil one and oil deficiency with bertrand boisson who is actually the uh, first author of the paper that uh, sonia showed in next slide um we were really uh, intrigued by uh, the observation yes number two there 
we were intrigued by one observation that has been confirmed actually in other cases. So if you use different cell types for in vitro studies, uh, you may find totally different results. So what is important in, uh, in, in this complex is that um, in order to, um, to uh, reveal a hyperinflammatory phenotype, you have to look at a monocyte. Um, you don't see this, uh, you don't see this using uh, other cell types like fibroblasts and, uh, or, um, or other um, or lymphocytes. You really have to use monocytes. So, uh, and, and on the other hand, you have uh, more of a defect in, uh, in the NF-kappa-B induction in, that you see uh, better in fibroblasts. So depending on the cell type that you use, uh, you may get uh, uh, quite different results. And maybe that's the explanation for the association of hyperinflammation and immunodeficiency at the same time. It really depends on the nature of the cell type that is involved, uh, whether you're uh, more uh, looking at an autonomous phenotype or more of an immunodeficiency phenotype. All right, let me see here. Lymphangiectasia is a clue here for NIM or other defects in f kappa pathways. Again, I could not. Uh, in, lymphangiectasia has only been seen in the other case um, that um, um, Sonia um, talked about. We were not able to identify a clear basis for the lymphangiectasia in that case. Um, 36 uh, ligand shedding, yes, that has been uh, proposed actually um, as a possible screening test. I, you know, the problem with that is that um, 62L is rapidly shed, and so um, uh, you have to do it uh, basically uh, in your place. You can't, you can't really ship this material, uh, biological specimens, to look at shedding of 62 ligand. So it, it's, it's a difficult assay to perform. Um, so what is your what is your plan in terms of treatment, Sonia, at this point? So at this point, we have her on um, subcutaneous immunoglobulin. She's been doing much better from an uh, infectious point of view. Um, she had she was briefly on like sulfasalazine uh, for a year and then had dress syndrome for it, so we're not going anywhere near that. Um, there actually hasn't been any mention of like restarting a TNF inhibitor, but it, I think that would be kind of interesting if things start getting out of hand, especially if her repeat of cardiac MRI um, potentially has more issues. But so you may you may want to talk also you may want to talk also to Ivona Kierkevich or Dan Kastner here at the NIH because again they have other cases and uh, they can tell you about their experience also with TNF inhibitors. That would be great. Well, that was a, was a wonderful case, Sonia. Uh, really difficult condition to manage, not an easy one. Um, I'm also grateful to everybody who posted um, interesting hypotheses and questions and uh, remarks in the chat. Um, if there are no other comments or questions, um, yeah, uh, rituximab, rituxan doesn't really help in this case. There is, again, there is no um, obvious role for true autoimmunity. Uh, there is no evidence of lymphoproliferation here. So rituxan is not really, um, is not, should not re really be on the table. Uh, because the CD20 is high, yeah, but you know, you don't treat, we don't treat numbers. Um, so you really want to look at the pathophysiology of the disease. You, you need to interfere with the pathway. Rituxan wouldn't help in this case. So Dr. Notarangelo, one more question about the lung findings with the nodules. Would you consider treatment for that uh, with TNF inhibitor? Well, you want to be sure, of course, that there are, I mean, are you worried about mycobacteria disease and other, of course, you need to screen these patients for um, mycobacteria disease. Infections, um, sure. Yeah, in general, infections and, and specifically, in particular, mycobacteria disease before you consider TNF inhibitors. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. okay.
All right. right. Thank again. you, Dr. Dr. Thank you, um, oh, thank Dr. You. Great job, Sonia. Thank you so much. Thank you for your help. I really appreciate it. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.